Boldwood presents The Widow's Wine Club Written by Julia Jarman and read by Naomi Madeline The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 11 September 2008 Viv How the hell do you choose? Viv Halliday, assured of privacy for the delicate task by the funeral director, was trying to match the coffins in front of her with the pictures in the catalogue. Coffins. Viv, a gardener, liked to call a spade a spade. She'd had enough of caskets and precious contents and resting places and loved one was beginning to grate. Jack wasn't a bloody jewel in a jewellery box and he wasn't having a kip. He hadn't passed away like a bad smell. He'd died and she was trying to choose one of these boxes because that was what the what to do when someone dies guide said she should. Downloaded from the internet, it claimed to cover all aspects of the bereavement experience but clearly didn't. Some of the funeral director's questions had taken her by surprise. Would you like your loved one embalmed? A. Fully. B. Partially. Or C. Not at all, Mrs Robson. Embalmed. It was one of those words you thought you knew. Mummies came into it, and royals, and waxen Russian leaders. But she'd had to ask what he meant. Reply, not at all, to filling Jack with preservatives and put him right about her name. My apologies, Mr Crombie Jr., an elderly, bald man, had corrected his notes. Now, what is Mr Robson going to wear, Miss Halliday? Wear? But he's... She had caught on just in time. Did everyone else know these things? Jack didn't care what he wore when he was alive, for fuck's sake. Pass. But shrugged shoulders wouldn't do. Mr Crombie had prompted gently, what he wore for a much-loved hobby, perhaps? A favourite suit, or maybe... He'd reached for another brochure, one of our gowns. That was when she'd started giggling, picturing Jack in one of the nighties he was pointing to, available in pink, blue or oyster satin, with or without a thrill. Well, Jack would have laughed. Bloody hell, do you want me to look like Widow Twanky? She had felt him by her side, heard him snort as he wiped his eyes. No worries, Miss Halliday. Mr Crombie had retrieved the brochure. Grief takes the, bere the bereaved. That was who she was now, ticking off items from a long list. Get medical certificate, tick. Register death, tick. Take birth certificate with you, tick, tick. Tick, tick, like a bloody clock or a bomb. The bereaved must now choose a casket. But she couldn't because she hadn't got a clue. Because she'd never done this before. Because she didn't feel bereaved. She felt like Viv Halliday, wife. Viv Halliday, mum. Viv Halliday, gran. Viv Halliday, gardener. Planting a beech hedge today in Mrs James's garden. That was what it said she was doing in her diary, and it was the right weather for it. A dull, damp autumn day. She should be out there in the fresh air, not in this weird room, staring at furniture she didn't want. She had wandered into the wrong shop and must say, sorry, thank you, just looking, and leave. But to who? To whom? She had been an English teacher once. Not to the glamorous black woman coming in now, dabbing her eyes. Clearly a mourner, she looked dressed for the part from stylish beret on well-groomed hair to shiny patent courts. Suddenly, Viv's own fleece, denims and trainers and dry eyes seemed not right. Get on with it. The coffins all looked much the same. That was the main problem. On beers, was that the word for the metal stands? with lids slightly raised, they spooked her a bit, though the layout was more Ikea than crypt. Did they come in flat pack? How did you choose between the oak, the mahogany, the rosewood and the maple, all available in light, dark, solid or veneer? Or the oddly named 
Last Supper would unspecified, or the basic funeral also would unspecified, or the last resting place material unspecified. But it looked like polystyrene and, oh, she glanced inside, was lined with pink taffeta, ruched. Well, not that one. Prices at the back, love. Oh, thanks. She turned towards the elegantly dressed black woman who'd spoken and, fuck, caught the lid of Last Supper with her elbow. Sorry, but it bloody hurt. The woman waved away Viv's apology as the lid snapped shut loudly. My fault, shouldn't have butted in. She dabbed at her eyes with a wad of sodden tissues and a man coming in harumphed. Oh dear. The frumpy older woman with him, his mother perhaps, looked embarrassed. Viv found a packet of Kleenex in her pocket and gave them. Have these, pet. Not your fault. Born clumsy, that's me. And I'm all over the place at the moment. The woman, neat and petite, made her feel like a hollyhock at the front of the border. Too tall, too floppy, too, too. No, keep the packet. I don't seem to need them. Thanks. The woman nodded. Still numb. Not done it before. Three times me. Sorry, saying too much again. But the thing to remember, she nodded at the coffins, is there's not much to choose between them all except the prices. It's not as if you're buying it to last, is it? Viv laughed. Oh, was that another harumph from the man now steering the tweed-clad frumpy woman towards the coffins as if she were a bit of unwieldy luggage? Let me sort at Mum. That's what I've come all this way for. All this way? His accent was Antipodean, but hooray! The luggage was fighting back, detaching herself from his grip. It's sorted, Grant. As I said, the coffin is ordered already. I did it when I came in yesterday. Now let's go and see your dad in the Chapel of Rest, shall we? That's what I thought we came for. The luggage sounded a bit Scottish, but Mum, Dad wouldn't like bamboo. Grant, your father is dead, she spoke firmly. Intriguing. Viv liked bamboo, but it was a surprise. The woman's tweed suit and permed grey hair said conservative, very. Oh, look, dear. She took another step away from her son. The lights are coming on, Grant. I thought it was rather dark in here. And here's Mr Plunkett Senior. Has there been a power cut, Mr Plunkett? Indeed, there has, Mrs Carmichael. And, uh... The silver-haired, portly Mr Plunkett, flanked by Mr Crombie Junior and a younger female, swivelled round to include them all. There had been a prolonged power cut, which had turned off not only the lights and heating and sound system, but also the electronic device for alerting staff to the arrival of clients. That was why, sadly, he almost bent double, they were all here together in the casket room, without the privacy Plunkett and Crombie usually afforded the bereaved. As waves of Elgar began to lap around the room and lights flickered into life, Mrs Carmichael asked the funeral director to take her son to the Chapel of Rest to see his father. No, no thank you, Mr Plunkett. I won't go again. I paid my respects yesterday. Should I go and see Jack again? When Viv had seen him last, he was still in the hospital bed where he'd died, and his lip... It had been hard to believe he wasn't asleep. Why? Why had he done it like that, dying in the few minutes she'd taken to nip to the loo, so she couldn't say goodbye? Would seeing him now, chilled like a waxwork, cold to her touch, make her feel better, stop her feeling like an automaton? But before she had a chance to decide, here was Mr Crombie Jr. again, clipboard at the ready, wanting to know what she'd chosen. Ip, dip, sky blue. Who's it? Not you. Chapter 2. Viv Decision made, oak, solid, because that was Jack, Viv got into her ancient Range Rover and drove to Elmsley, a village ten miles north of the town of Bedford, where she'd lived for over thirty years, 
first with Jack and the girls, then with just Jack, now... But it wasn't the time to reminisce, must concentrate. Reaching the village, she slowed down, then stopped by the bridge on the high street, causing the Volvo that had been up her arse all the way from the bypass to screech to a halt, then roar past in a cloud of angry exhaust. Idiot male driver. What time was it? Should she go home to her empty house at the far end of the village or call on her bestie? That was what she'd stopped to decide. Would Angie be pleased to see her? She had leaned on her heavily these last few days. Would she have a bottle open? If she hadn't, it wouldn't take much to get her to open one. A crashing coffin lid would do it, embarrassment topping the Richter scale. The church clock struck five as she reached Angie's picturesque thatch at the bottom of Church Lane. For sale. Why? Why did that sign still give her a jolt when it had been there for months? Because, recession or not, some rich bastard would snap it up before you could say offshore account, and any day now, her best friend would be gone. Don't be selfish. Lily needs Angie more. Angie's only daughter had just had triplets, and Angie was moving to be near her. Of course, quite right too. Angie was kind and practical and sensible and supportive and wanted to know her grandchildren. Too bloody sensible. Don't pull that face. I'm thinking of our livers. Angie filled the teapot from the kettle. Tea first. Now, to answer your question, is burying Jack next door the right thing to do? They could see the churchyard from the kitchen window. A few sunken gravestones were visible under the trees, their leaves tinged with autumn colour. What did the man say? Do what the hell you like, if I remember rightly. Whatever makes you feel better. Nothing ever will. But she didn't say that. Didn't want to sound pathetic or be pathetic. Angie had done enough. She'd been by her side during the whole sodding business. She knew almost as much about Jack's horrible dying as Viv did. But she couldn't keep leaning on Angie. So, what would make you feel worse? Angie filled mugs from a large red teapot. Slide in curtains? Decision made. Tick. Where's your list? Viv Halliday, you've put hours of work into that churchyard gratis. More than most of the faithful. So sod the holy snipers. You've got every right to plant Jack there. You've turned it into a nature reserve. I saw a couple of brimstone butterflies walking Buster this morning. Now, what's next? Angie looked at the list, fingers pushing back her thick white hair. It had been black when they'd met at the school gate 30 years ago. But Jack didn't do God, and nor do I. I said decision made. Angie's voice was firm. Now, what shall I open, red or white? You are staying, not a question. I've got a pasta bake in the oven and I'll make a salad. Back in a mo. She headed for the garden. Buster, an unattractive white bull terrier, plodding at her heels. Get on with it. Viv gave herself a tick for choosing a coffin and a metaphorical smack for feeling sorry for herself. Be grateful. She had had 40 lovely years with Jack. He'd been a brill, supportive husband. She couldn't have given up teaching and started her gardening business without his support. And he hadn't buggered off when things got tough, like Angie's husband leaving her with a baby to bring up on her own. Now it was time to stand on her own two feet, see what she was made of. She was a feminist, for fuck's sake. Though all three daughters laughed when she said so, Beth bordering on the contemptuous. Mum, you've never, ever lived on your own, have you? Didn't you go straight from living at home with your mum to living in a hall of residence with other girls to living with Dad? Yes, I did. We did in those days. Sally had agreed with her sister. You do lean on Dad, Mum. And he leans on me, she had snapped back. We lean on each other when we need to. That's what a good marriage is about. Still single M had sighed. I wish. But Beth had rolled her eyes, because if she leaned on Lionel, he'd fall over. Where are your girls at the moment? Angie and the dog were back with assorted green leaves. 
Could Angie read her mind? Gone home. I sent them. They managed to get on for a couple of days, doing looking after mum, but I didn't think it could last. And they have families to look after and jobs. They'll be here for the funeral. The funeral. They were back to that. Angie, the undertakers wanted to know what Jack would wear. Janet. A suit. What Malcolm would wear, dead or alive, wasn't a problem for Janet Carmichael. She had been looking after his clothes for years, washing, mending and taking them to the cleaners, packing and unpacking his case for business trips and golfing holidays and occasional stays with relatives. She'd bought a lot of them herself, so she'd taken the pinstripe with her the previous day when she had ordered the bamboo casket. It was one of two he had worn every day to go to the bank. Both had hung in the wardrobe since his retirement, except when he'd taken one out to wear for the all-too-frequent funerals of recent years. It was the obvious choice. Janet knew the form. She had buried her mother and father years before, and a beloved maiden aunt more recently. She knew what to do, and thought she knew how she would feel. She expected to feel low, to miss her husband of forty years, to weep even more perhaps than for Aunt Flo. She had, after all, been not only his wife, but for the past thirty years his PA too. Now, as Grant turned the Volvo into the close, she felt less sure about her feelings, and a headache was pounding, not helped by his mounting tetchiness. Stuck behind a Range Rover for the last stretch along the village high street, driven by the woman at the undertaker's, he had said, the gawky one who'd crashed into the coffin and sworn, he'd accelerated aggressively past her when she'd stopped suddenly. Janet hadn't said, but thought it unlikely that it was the same woman. Even she would have heard if anyone else in the village had died. All she wanted to do now was get in the house without seeing any of the neighbours, tell Grant to get himself something for dinner, down a couple of paracetamol and go to bed. But of course she didn't. She found some potatoes and set about making a cottage pie, hoping no one else would knock on the door to express their condolences or push a card through the letterbox. She'd been surprised at how many she'd received, many from people she didn't know or didn't know she knew. Elmsley wasn't the sort of village where everyone knew everyone else, not with its mile-long high street and new developments full of young families, but it was becoming clear that more people knew her or of her, than she had realised. It was, of course, better than living in a town where you could die in a high-rise flat and not be found for weeks, like some poor man she had read about recently. You couldn't die in your bed or do anything else. Oh, the doorbell. Not again. Who was this? She waited for Grant to go and open it, hoping he wouldn't fetch her to talk to whoever it was. So sorry to hear about your poor dear father. It was a woman's voice. Thank you, er, uh, Mrs Thornton? Yes. The visitor sounded pleased. Thornton. Barbara Thornton from over the road. She'd been the bursar at the school Grant went to, but it was odd that he remembered her. She'd had more to do with parents than pupils, Janet was straining to hear now, but didn't pick up anything else till Grant came into the kitchen holding a card. Mrs Thornton gave me this. He held on to it. Is she still there? No, she went home. Said she lived over the road now? Yes. She had moved in years ago, but after Grant had left home. Janet saw later that the card was addressed to him, which was interesting. It was because Grant was a former pupil, she supposed. Zelda Zelda Fielding got home before either Viv or Janet, despite leaving Plunkett and Crombies after them. She lived on the outskirts of town, on an estate of houses built in the 70s. It was only about a mile away, so she could have walked to the funeral directors, and probably should have, but she had taken the car. What was the point of keeping fit now? Oh, dear. There was William's car parked in the drive of her semi, and Tracy was getting out, followed by Errol. That was why they weren't at the funeral parlour. She'd got it all wrong as usual. 
And there were Mac and Morag at the front room window, barking their little hearts out, so pleased to see her. Where have you been, Zelda? Tracy flung her arms around her as soon as they met on the pavement. Didn't we say we'd pick you up and all go together? Errol and William hugged her as well. So like Harry, William was. Oh, no, she was off again, but it didn't matter. Tracy was brimming over and so was Errol. Harry's kids were great. If she'd been their real mum, they couldn't have treated her better. They went inside. The dogs were delighted and Errol phoned to check what time Plunkett and Crombie closed. Then they all went back there and agreed quickly on basic funeral. Tracy said there would be so many flowers no one would see what was underneath. Then the three of them took her to the Swan in town for an early supper. You must eat, Zelda. Why? What was the point? But she didn't say that. Twelve days later, on the same cold September day, the three women... Zelda said goodbye to Harry, wearing his best double-breasted suit, in a full gospel service at the crematorium. Viv saw Jack lowered into his grave in the churchyard of All Saints, wearing a pair of worn denims and a blue check shirt, a trowel in his hand. Janet dispatched Malcolm in a woodland cemetery in the next village, after a service at the Presbyterian Church in town, the one they'd attended since leaving Scotland many years before. He wore his pinstriped suit, complete with the contents of his back pocket. Let him explain those to his maker. Jobs done, tick, 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 with varying degrees of satisfaction, they all went home to begin their new lives alone. NSNBW, Wallington Street, London, SW1, 4th March 2009. Dear friend, no one knows how I feel. Is that what you're thinking at this moment? Do you feel isolated and alone, as if no one understands, and as if this long winter will never end? Do you even feel that you might be going a little bit crazy? Let me offer my heartfelt sympathy on the recent loss of your life partner and assure you that you are not alone. A widow myself and chair of a charity supporting women experiencing the loss of their life partner, I'm inviting you to join us, the National Society for Newly Bereaved Widows, and meet others in the same situation. Our secular organisation exists to help the bereaved recover from their loss and develop a new sense of purpose as they face life alone and provide opportunities to do so. Branches all over the country offer practical help, counselling if requested, and most importantly, diverting social events. Your local branch meets at St Saviour's Church Hall, Linnet Drive, MK 42 1BD, and meetings are held monthly. Your next group meeting is on the 25th of March. Do come along to talk to women who have been through and come through what you are going through. You are guaranteed a warm welcome. Spring will come. Yours sincerely, Wilhelmina Alsop. Viv binned the letter. Zelda pinned it to her kitchen notice board. Janet filed it under Malcolm, deceased. Chapter 3. Viv. What is your password, madam? As Viv clutched the phone, trying to be as civil as the man at the other end, a tile fell off the wall. My... She had been trying to get into Jack's online bank account. I need my husband's password. Jack Robson's, my late husband. Late as in dead, she added, for her own good as much as his. Then, hanging on while he went to consult his line manager, she picked up bits of the jade green tile, part of a border surrounding the kitchen window. They didn't make that colour anymore, or that size or shape, so she must mend it, along with the corner cupboard door and collapsing pergola in the garden, brought down by heavy snow in March. March? This winter was going on forever. Can you tell me your password, madam? Oh, 
But she must persevere. She needed to know how much there was in Jack's bank account, and she couldn't get into his bank account without his password. And if she couldn't get into his bank account, not that there was much in it. It's only money, she used to say, till they hadn't got any, till Northern Rock, the so-called ethical bank, disappeared with their savings. I am sorry for your loss, madam. Please tell me the maiden name of your late husband's father's mother. I don't know. Nor did she know the name of Jack's first pet, or his nickname at school, or the first road he lived in. How many years had she known the man? Concentrate. Madam, the man was speaking again, I need to consult my manager and ring you back. The phone rang again as she was congratulating herself on some excellent jigsaw work on the tile. Could I speak to the account holder, please? Deep breath. Sorry, but I have explained that my husband is dead. I am sorry for your loss, madam. Please can you tell me your late husband's full name? John James Robson. And your full name, madam, Vivian Halliday. Was her feminist gesture of years ago making things worse? And the maiden name of your late husband's father's mother? Ah! The man tried to be helpful and went off script. Had her late husband possibly written this information down somewhere? No, because you were told not to, and because Jack had a good memory, a very good brain, right to the end. He didn't need to write things down. He thought he was more likely to forget if he did write things down. Stop! Stop rambling! The man didn't need to know how clever and wonderful Jack was. Why? Why hadn't she asked Jack about this stuff before he died? Because, by the time she had thought of it, it had been too late. Mrs Halliday! The but only to suggest she make another search for the vital information. Fine, she said, but it wasn't. She couldn't think of anywhere else to look, and she had a list as long as her arm to get through. Mrs O'Connor's greenhouse was waiting. There were seeds to set and bare root roses to buy from George Beaumont Nurseries, and she must fit in a visit to Angie, who was moving today. But best not to think of that. Better, perhaps, to advertise for more work and ask George and Annie Beaumont to keep an ear open for people wanting help, preferably for garden design. A listed Art Deco house was expensive to run. In the evening, optimism fuelled by a couple of glasses of wine, she decided to have one last search for Jack's passwords. He must have written them down. Didn't everyone? So, carefully, so the iron rungs of the spiral staircase didn't clang, she climbed up to his study. And even before she reached the landing, she saw that the lamp in his study was on, the door framed with light. He was there. Must be. She tiptoed, then opened the door carefully, silently. Why are you avoiding me? The light went out as she stepped inside. Later, downstairs in her own study, she berated herself. For fuck's sake, was she going mad? What would Jack think? What would he think of his rational, earthy, down-to-earth Viv, his touchstone, his voice of reality, going on like this? You are dead, six feet under, she said aloud. Dead, dead, dead. She all but banged her head on the desktop. Then she saw it, the letter she'd binned weeks ago in the waste paper bin, which she'd emptied umpteen times since. There it was, stuck at the bottom, staring up at her. Was it a sign? A message saying she should go? She'd be reading tea leaves next. But she checked the date on her watch. Yes, that was tonight. And if she didn't go, she'd finish the bottle. Zelda Zelda was looking at the same letter, still pinned to her kitchen notice board. Shall I go? She wiped her eyes. You've been out all day. Max stood by his empty dish. Why not? 
Morag, more encouraging, looked up from her half-eaten dinner. Tears dripped onto the ready meal Zelda had just got out of the microwave. She'd managed all day in the salon without crying. No point in depressing the clients. But now... You've got us. The two little dogs followed her into the sitting room and got onto the settee beside her. White fur on blue fabric was not a good mix, but they were worth the extra hoovering. What would she do without them? Such a comfort. But it was no good pretending. They weren't Harry. They missed him too. Harry was the one who'd been with them all day after all. He'd got their meals and hers. She put the bland whatever it was on the side table and pulled up the poof. No, Mac, leave it. But it was too late. And he might as well finish it off as she wasn't going to. She put her throbbing legs up. I shouldn't be on my feet all day, not at my age. Retire then? Morag nuzzled closer. Stay at home with us. And cry all day. Retrieving the plate from Mac, she got up and took it to the kitchen. She couldn't afford to retire. The crash had hit her pension pot hard. Sophisticates was surviving, but only just. No one would buy it, not at the moment. Not with three more businesses up for sale in the high street. Before the crash, she'd talked about handing over the day-to-day -day running to Carol as manager. She and Harry had made plans. Lovely plans. His pension supplementing hers, moving to Spain or Barbados. She tore off more kitchen roll. Don't cry. Morag had followed her into the kitchen. But it was hard not to. Today was Wednesday, which was Harry's day for bringing his mum into the salon, so perhaps that was why she was having a bigger downer than usual. Maybe you should go to that meeting. Was the clever little dog really looking up at the notice board? She read the letter again and checked the calendar. Yes, tonight at 8pm. New sense of purpose. Practical help. Counselling. Was that what she needed? It was only a short walk to St Saviour's Church Hall. Heads I stay, tails I go, she said, tossing a coin even as she stood by the front door. It was tails. So she left Mac with his tail between his legs. Chapter 4 Zelda When Zelda saw Viv standing under the porch light of St Saviour's Church Hall, she thought she had met her before but couldn't quite place her. Was she one of her occasional clients? Did she come into the salon from time to time? If she could see her hair, she would know, but... Unlike Zelda, the woman was dressed for the weather in a hooded barber, which put her face in shadow. Come under here, pet. The woman stepped up. You look like a drowned rat. The voice resonated too. Thanks, I feel like one. Zelda felt the rain dripping down her face. Oh, I didn't mean, sorry, big mouth. She had a northern accent. No offence taken. Zelda was sure she had heard that voice before. You knew here? They both spoke at the same time and then replied at the same time. Yes, are you? Then they laughed at the silliness of it and Zelda let her new acquaintance say, We're late, I think. Shall we go in? But as they went to push open the swing doors, a taxi drew up and a woman near tumbled out of the rear door. She would have fallen if they hadn't both rushed forward and grabbed an arm each. Thank you. The woman sounded more cross than grateful. I can manage now. Are you both here for the widow's group? Yes, well, I am. Zelda, Zelda Fielding. Pleased to meet you. She offered her hand. Yeah, I'm one of those too. The barbered woman offered hers. Vivality. Shall we go in? Plunkett and Crombie. It clicked as soon as they got inside the hall and uncovered their heads. Zelda could tell a lot from a head of hair. Coffin lid lady. That was who the woman in the barber was. Her auburn hair with a streak of white clinched it. And the Scottish lady, tight perm, straggly now, was the one with the disapproving man. The scene was vivid in Zelda's mind, but the other two hadn't made the connection. Neither of them recognised her. 
because all black faces look the same. Don't be chippy, Zeld. Right, Harry, they obviously don't recognise each other either. And she had put on a few pounds in the last six months. Custard creams, unlike the latest arrival. I'm J Janet Carmichael, by the way. Her tweed suit hung from her. Bloody hell, didn't know they were still going on. Lid Lady, Viv, Viv Halliday, clearly not listening, was staring at the scene in front of them. Zelda, trying to fix the woman's name in her head, was back in a church hall in Hitchin, a teenager with her mum at a... what did they call it? A beetle drive. That was it. The green, baize-covered, card-strewn tables were exactly the same. So were the thick, white cups on a table at the side, waiting to be filled with tea. Are we in the right place? The Scottish lady, Janet, Janet Carmichael, had fished a letter from her handbag. Obviously not. Zelda stepped back. The hostile stares of the beetle drivers would have repelled invaders, but one of them was hauling herself to her feet. Stocky with grey cropped hair, she looked like the gym teacher who'd made Zelda's life a misery many years ago. Of course you can run fast, Griselda. Stereotyping wasn't the worst of it. I had this letter. Janet Carmichael was handing it over. Did she want to join this crew? Well, she looked as if she'd fit in. Gym teacher perused. Oh, yes, we are the NSNBW. And yes, she turned towards the beetle drivers. Ladies, chop, chop, another table, please. She turned back to the three of them, smiling. We do welcome new members and offer support and diverting social activities. Tonight it's a beetle drive. First prize, a packet of Rolos, but no one goes home empty-handed. She gave a little laugh. All participants get a sample of Dentaflux. One of our members is lucky enough to have a daughter in the dental profession. Barbara Thornton, what's she doing here? Was that Janet who said that? Mardy Cow. That was definitely Viv. The other two had recognised one, possibly two, of the Beetle drivers, none of whom had moved to put up another table. I've had enough. As Zelda turned, to her surprise, so did the others. Their eyes met, brows raised in mutual disbelief. That was when they bonded, Zelda thought later, in that second of shared horror. Is this our destiny? Before rushing for the door, gym teacher in hot pursuit. You've got to move on, ladies. You've got to move on. Yeah, but a lot further than this. Viv was first out. They paused under the porch light, watching the rain bouncing off the cars in the car park before Zelda said, We've met before, you know. And they turned to look at her, recognition flickering first on Viv's face. Plunk it and crumby. She covered her mouth with her hand. Oh, my God. I'd never use them again. Janet shuddered. All three stared out at the rain, each with their own Plunkett and Crombie memories, until Viv broke the silence. Stinking night. Can I give anyone a lift? Thanks. Zelda accepted, telling them she only lived around the corner, and Janet said she would get a taxi as she lived out of town. Viv asked where, and it turned out they lived in the same village, and they, what a coincidence about that, and Janet accepted the lift. Then Viv made a dash to her car and brought it to the door. Should I ask them in for a coffee? Zelda, in the back seat, thought about it, decided against it, and found herself asking them anyway. It was fate, she'd decided in the short time it took to get to her house. Fate had brought them together twice now. They were obviously destined to get to know each other. Or a glass of wine, she said, as Viv and Janet consulted. I think I've got a bottle left over from Christmas. You're kidding. Viv laughed and turned off the engine. But why not, if that's all right with you, Janet? Just one for me, though, sadly. What sort of houses did they live in? Zelda wondered as she led the way into her tiny hallway. Bigger than hers, she'd bet. People in the villages tended to be well-heeled. No, darlings! 
the Westies hurtled out of the sitting room where they'd been looking out of the window waiting for her. Back, Morag. It's all right, Mac. He was making low, warning growls. These are friends. Friends. Though that might be presumptuous, she thought, as she bundled the dogs into the kitchen. Viv, Janet, make yourselves at home in the sitting room. There's a button on the wall for the gas fire. When she joined them a few minutes later, with a bottle of white and a bottle of red she'd found at the back of a cupboard, her little sitting room looked warm and welcoming. The curtains were closed and the gas fire was glowing, and Viv and Janet were sitting either side of it, discussing the neighbour they'd just seen. Seemed Mardy Cow and Barbara Thornton were the same person who lived in the barns, the close where Janet lived. I'm told she came to Jack's funeral. Viv accepted the bottle of red and the opener. Seems she goes to all the funerals, invited or not. Not just the service, but the wake afterwards. A funeral scavenger is, I think, the term. She definitely came to Malcolm's. Janet nodded a yes at the bottle of white, wearing a hat with wavy black feathers. Zelda poured some white into Janet's glass to see if it was OK. Viv poured herself a glass of red, and it obviously was OK. Don't worry, pet. She addressed Morag, who was looking anxiously at her from the sofa. We're not staying all night. But they had taken the precaution of booking a taxi, she revealed not much later. How long are they staying? Zelda had to get up in the morning to open the salon. Janet said the wine was pleasant, like a sweet sherry, croft perhaps, and it seemed to loosen her tongue almost instantly. The room went quiet as she started to speak, words jerking out of her like ketchup from a bottle unused for a very long time. I went to that so-called bereavement group to consult a professional to get help with something I can't get out of my mind. It was in its way a horror story, beginning when she heard the church door opening and looked over her shoulder to see the wrong casket being carried in by the pallbearers. That's not Malcolm, she thought, because she had ordered bamboo and this was wood. There has been a dreadful mistake, an awful mix-up. Poor woman. She was reliving the moment as she told them, gripping the glass in her shaking hand. I said, Grant, that's my son who is sitting with me in the front pew. There's been a terrible mistake. That's not your dad. But he muttered from the side of his mouth. No worries, Mum. I changed the order to mahogany. That's all. Now don't make a fuss. And I didn't. I, I couldn't. I was speechless, but... She shuddered, her arm in spasm, and the glass flew from her hand. I'd have killed him right then. Viv, on her feet, took hold of the sobbing Janet's hands as Zelda went to get the vacuum cleaner. When she returned, Viv was reassuring Janet that the broken glass didn't matter, but that her son, Grant, was that his name? Was a pillock. I hope you've told him what you think of him. Janet shook her head and said that wasn't really her style. Zelda tried to make the poor woman feel better too. That wasn't the first broken glass this room has seen, I assure you, Janet. I once hurled Harry from one end of the room to the other. His photograph, I mean. It was on the side table. A lovely photo of him in his cricket whites, mended now. I was so angry with him for leaving me. But why, she had to ask, did Plunkett and Crombie take your son's word over yours and not check with you, Janet? Because Janet's a woman on her own, Viv sounded certain. I've noticed a lot of people telling me what to do these days, as if I've lost my brain along with my husband. Trouble is, they might be right. She didn't expand on that, and after Zelda had put the vacuum away, she turned to her. Your turn now, Zelda. We know what Janet wanted and didn't get from the Death Watch Beatles. What made you wend your way on a cold, rainy night to the sodding, useless NSNBW? Deep breath. Could she get through this? No. She was off again, demonstrating her problem. Was it normal, she wanted to know, to be racked with grief after six months, bursting into tears night and day? 
The dogs moved closer, resting their heads on her thighs as she wept. Normal. Is there a normal? Viv put her glass down. If there is, I'm sure it's closer to what you're feeling, Zelda. When I was 16 and my dad still crying day and night months after he'd gone, I'd wake up with my pillow soaking and I'd hide in the labs at school so that others couldn't see, covering my red eyes with a curtain of hair when I came out. I'd think I was over it, then there'd be another wave. Wave was the word, floods of tears. And even years later, it didn't take much to set me off. Sad stories, films, the funerals of people I hardly knew. I expected that again, dreaded it, but also longed for the letting go. But when I gave myself permission to grieve, as all the fucking books tell you to do, there was nothing to permit. I haven't shed one tear. Janet moved back in her seat. Did you? Viv anticipated Janet's question. Yes, Janet, I saw his body. Twice. I did everything the bloody how-to guide told me to do. Well, she looked from one to the other. Do I need a shrink? That's what I wanted to find out from the group. Viv drained the glass and refilled it. Or am I just a heartless bitch? Perhaps... Janet started to say something, then shook her head, and Viv carried on as if thinking aloud. I don't feel as if Jax did. That's the trouble. I know he did, but I don't feel it. I still talk to him. I talk to Harry. It was good admitting it. And I still think he might be here every time I come home from work. Me too. Viv nodded. I still hear Malcolm telling me what to do. Janet accepted a refill. And what not to do? She took a gulp, frowned, and raised her hand as if at a meeting. Excuse me, but I would like to say thank you to both of you for this evening, especially you, Zelda, for inviting us into your home. It has been very helpful, much better than... She hesitated. The sodding useless NSNBW. Well said. Viv raised her glass with a smile. Thank you, Zelda, for your kindness and generosity. Crikey, all this praise. She didn't know where to put herself or how to respond to Janet's next remark. Janet's hand was up again. Ladies, I would like to propose that we form our own widow's support group. Silence. You could hear the gas fire puttering. Viv obviously didn't know what to say, but her body language said no. Janet Carmichael was prickly, for want of a better word, or starchy. Unbending might be better. Prim, proper. You'd have to think twice before you opened your m- I have spoken out of turn. Janet struggled to her feet. No, no, you haven't. Sit down. Viv looked at her watch, obviously playing for time, reluctant to hurt the other woman's feelings, but also reluctant to commit to seeing her again. Though we ought to be going soon, it's a good idea, Janet, giving each other support. I, uh, don't like the W word, that's all. W word? Widow. Viv answered Zelda's unvoiced question. From the same root as void, as in nulland, it comes with weeds and mites and other nasties. Sorry, I was a teacher once. Janet nodded. I too care about words, Viv. I abhor cliché, but null and void accurately describes how I felt when my son ignored my wishes. Because he treated you as a person of no account, but we mustn't let others define us. Viv sounded defiant. Or define ourselves by how we feel at the moment. If I thought I was what I feel like now, like a bulb buried under several feet of heavy clay, unlikely to ever put up a green shoot, let alone burst into flower, I'd end it now. Zelda watched Mac and Morag get down from the sofa. It was time for their walk around the block. Mac fetched his lead and put it on her lap, but Viv and Janet had started brainstorming alternatives for the W word and a name for their group. The newly single? Janet didn't like that. She said it sounded like one of those dating agencies. 
Why did they need a name? As she wondered how to ask politely what time their taxi was booked for, Zelda's eyes fell on the empty bottle of white, a Muscat Blanc 2007. Muscat. Musketeers. She held up the bottle. How about the three musketeers? Brilliant! Viv raised her glass of red. To the three musketeers. Janet raised her glass too. All for one and one for all. But would they actually see each other again? As Zelda locked up for the night, she had her doubts. They'd exchanged mobile numbers, but when Janet had got out her diary and suggested some dates for a meeting at her house next time, Viv had stalled, saying she would get in touch when she had consulted her diary. And people often said things they didn't mean, especially after a few drinks. Chapter 5. Janet As Janet recalled the previous evening, sunlight streamed through the gap in her bedroom curtains and a blackbird carolled away in the cherry tree outside, and she felt better than she had done for months. Those, I can do what I want today. I can do exactly what I like. The thought was thrilling. I can stay in bed all day if I like and read. But the book by her bed wasn't riveting. I could go to London and see an exhibition, but I've got the Monet booked for next month. I needn't cook, I needn't clean, I can do anything I like. As these unusual thoughts kept coming, her eyes fell on the bedroom curtains. I don't like them. Regency stripes in beige and maroon had never appealed. Won't they do? Malcolm had said when they'd been in the shop less than 20 minutes. Yes, she had said. Yes, I suppose they will. She'd known he'd be tetchy if she made him late for golf. And they had done, for years and years. But they won't do now. She flung back the duvet. Ridiculous extravagance. Malcolm was with her on the way to Cambridge in the taxi. I can't drive. You wouldn't let me learn. You didn't need to. I took you wherever you wanted to go. Wherever you allowed me to go. You don't need new curtains. But I want them. Waste is sinful. Whose voice was that? Malcolm's? Mother's? Father's? God's? There was a crowd in her head. I'll give the old ones to a charity. Fortunately, the partition was closed and the driver couldn't hear her talking, if she was talking aloud. She hoped she wasn't, but she didn't care too much. She would give away a lot of other stuff, too. It would be the spring clean of all spring cleans. She would spend some of that amazingly large sum of money Malcolm had left her. As the taxi sped past the flat Fenland fields, the sun on the surface water making them gleam, she planned the transformation of her house. Out would go the huge TV dominating the sitting room, along with the subscription to Sky Sports. In would come something more discreet. Out would go the never-comfortable black leather Chesterfields, more suitable for a men's club than a family sitting room. In would come something squashy and comfortable, with a high back and foot supports. Out would go those gloomy dark wood units in the kitchen. In would come something lighter and brighter. But first she'd do their bedroom. Her bedroom. Meeting Viv and Zelda last night was surely the catalyst for this readiness for change. Learning that Viv lived in that unusual art deco house on the high street was certainly a factor. Zelda's little house, too, was stylish, on the inside if not the out. The kitchen, which she had caught a glimpse of, was blue and yet the sitting room was light and warm, colourful, not beige and maroon. Janet was heading straight to John Lewis. It was a delicious day. She went from department to department, from curtains to carpets to lighting and then back to curtains after coffee. She had realised as soon as she stepped inside the store that the whole room needed a makeover. But where to begin? She started with ready-mades because it would be nice to go home and hang them that night. 
but none of them were exactly what she wanted. So, proceeding to fabrics, she spent the rest of the morning getting assistance to pull out the heavy rolls of linens and brocades and velvets so she could see and smell and hold the fabrics against her face, picturing how they would look in her room. Floor to ceiling, she soon decided, encouraged by an assistant specialising in interior design. Falling in rich folds, pooling on the floor, opulent, not short and skimpy, barely meeting at the edges. By one o'clock, her head was a kaleidoscope of colours and she still hadn't decided on a colour scheme. She paused for thought over a proper lunch with a glass of wine in the restaurant and then decided to go home and mull it over. But then, on the way to the exit, walking through lighting, she saw them. Tiffany lamps in the classic dragonfly design that she'd always loved in amethyst and emerald green and creamy white, suffragette colours. Gorgeous. It didn't take her long to choose curtain fabrics and carpets and cushions to tone in with the lovely lamps. Three, one for each side of the bed and an overhead. Then bed linen in the same creamy white, Egyptian cotton, 1,000 threads. Assistance helped her carry everything to the cash desk, where Malcolm joined her again, muttering in her ear, Do we really need all that? Yes, she snapped back, startling the girl on the till. Was that the magical thinking the American woman wrote about? There were so many books on bereavement these days, so many psychological theories. Five stages of grief, six, seven? Surely there were only two. How do I live without him and how the bloody hell did I live with him? You all right with this? said the girl cashier. Yes, I'm fine, thank you. She wiped her eye. Perfect, we're fine. She hadn't felt so good for years. Why, Malcolm, why? What were you saving it all for? She was home by four. As the taxi drew up to her door, Barbara crossed the road from her house on the corner with her little hairless dog, which stopped. Hello, Barbara, Janet said, suddenly full of goodwill and a twinge of guilt, remembering that she'd been at that dreadful widow's meeting last night. When had Barbara's husband died? It was remiss of her not to know. She had always been Mrs Thornton at St Bede's Prep, but when she had moved into the close, she hadn't brought a husband with her. Janet resolved to try harder to be neighbourly. The taxi driver offered to carry her parcels to the door, and by the time the taxi had gone, Barbara was back in her own front garden. Spending your inheritance, I see. What an odd thing to call out. What had Viv Halliday called her? Mardy Cow. She was more crow than cow with her scraped back grey hair and garb of black trousers, not so very different from the business suit she used to wear all those years ago. Move on, Barbara. Rebuffed and a bit hurt, she'd meant well. Janet closed her own front door, wondering if Viv would get in touch. Viv. Viv was wondering if she should reach out too, as she tied in the long stems of a winter-flowering clematis flopping all over her pergola, aware that Janet Carmichael only lived round the corner, so now would be hard to avoid. What have I let myself in for? Why did I say I'd get in touch with these two women, one a fountain of despair, the other an uptight, disapproving old fuddy-duddy? They'll drag me down, make me feel worse. But she had said she would, and she was a woman of her word. And she already felt she owed them, Zelda, for her hospitality. And they had both been supportive in their different ways. She had to admit she felt better because of the offloading, lighter somehow. She did still need support, like this clematis, whose fragrant white flowers were almost hidden by the dark leathery leaves. Every year she wondered if she should replace it with something more attractive and trainable till she got a whiff of its heavenly scent. What were these women's redeeming qualities? What are yours? A voice muttered in her ear. Chapter 6 Zelda Zelda loved Viv's kitchen. 
Knickers. Did Janet just say knickers? Surely not. Concentrate. Pen poised, Janet was taking notes, like the PA she had once been, it seemed, though no one had asked her to. Or perhaps Viv had while Zelda was studying her kitchen. Yeah, new knickers. Viv was pouring coffee from a blue enamel percolator into black and white china cups with triangular handles. Unless you are, it's my morale raising tip of the week. The result of a mind blowing insight when I went to get clean pants on Thursday morning. Sloggies. I love them, but mine were slogged out. She handed Janet a cup of coffee in one of the stylish cups. You don't have to write all this down, by the way. We don't need minutes, do we? It was Sunday morning, four days after they'd met at Zelda's own house. Viv's call on Friday night had come as one surprise, and her kitchen was another, old-fashioned in a way she couldn't date. They were back in the 1920s, perhaps, sitting around a marble-topped table on bentwood chairs, more comfortable than they looked. Yeah, Viv handed Zelda one of the black and white cups. Anyway, when I saw the dreary heap of grey cotton that constituted my lingerie collection, I knew I was doomed if I put a pair on, so I grabbed the M&S vouchers I got for Christmas and headed straight for town. Without any knickers? Janet was still pen-poised. Was that a dry sense of humour or a very literal mind? It was hard to tell. Viv's laugh came a moment later as if she'd been wondering too. Viv's kitchen could not be described as dreary. It felt as if sunlight was streaming through the window, but it was the sunflower yellow tiles on the wall that made it feel warm and sunny. Would Viv mind if she took a photo of it to show Tracy? It was an unusual colour scheme. The window was bordered by sea-green tiles, like a proscenium arch, so the garden outside looked like the set for a play. The importance of being Viv. Would someone step out of that covered walkway and say, A handbag? Now Viv was saying she had ended up with seamless waist highs, cotton gusset, edged in black lace. Comfortable and stylish, and three for two. It's comfort first with me, and I hope you... She looked from one to the other and said she'd also bought a matching bra. For added uplift? Janet's face gave nothing away. Yeah, said Viv, physically and mentally. Good. Janet put down her pen and said she'd been shopping too, in Cambridge, on the day after their first get-together when she had woken up transformed. Shopping? She sounded as if she'd bought half of John Lewis. Excellent, Viv was admiring. We must give ourselves these boosts as often as we can, though. Speaking for myself, I'll need ways that don't involve cash. Me too, Zelda wanted to say, but it was hard to get a word in. Viv was off again. I suggest we think of our meetings as Weight Watchers in reverse. Instead of losing weight, we aim to gain and so we start with a weighing telling each other what we've each done to make ourselves feel better. Zelda, how was your week gone? Letter from someone who didn't know that Harry had died, downer. Call from banks saying outgoings at Sophisticuts are exceeding income, downer. Huge utility bills and Mac and Morag have got worms. Luckily, there was a distraction in the form of a ginger cat clattering into the room through a cat flap in the door. Meet Claudia said Viv as the animal headed for a dish under the table. A pushy, independent female and role model for us all. Cats are always kind to themselves. But... Zelda felt Viv's hand on hers. We can share the shit stuff as well. Better out than in. So she told them about the downers. But also that Tracy, Harry's daughter, had asked her to go on holiday with her, which was an upper... Oh, lovely. Where to? Janet was pen poised again. I didn't ask. Why ever not? Janet hadn't a clue how the non-rich lived. So Zelda didn't say cash, lack of, because she didn't want to be embarrassing. And she could put a short holiday on the card. But it wasn't the only reason. So she said, truthfully...